Hey, what I figured I'd start out with is just talking about some lessons that I learned as far as leadership with the 25 years that I spent in uniform with the United States Army. As a matter of fact, 30 years ago right now, I was in the middle of the Kuwait Desert in a thing called Desert Shield Desert Storm. I was in the 1st Infantry Division. I was in the lead infantry task force there. And uh, it, was, it was an incredible thing because I remember sitting down with my dad. My dad was a World War II corporal and him talking about being in combat. And then, of course, my older brother, who was a Marine infantryman in Vietnam, and he was wounded at a place called Khe San. And so at the age of 15, my dad sat me down on the steps of, of our house there in Atlanta, Georgia, and he challenged me to be the first officer in our family because he was just a corporal and my older brother was a lance corporal. So this whole thing about leadership, you know, started for me in 1976 when I was in high school junior ROTC in Atlanta, Georgia, and I continued on to Army ROTC at the University of Tennessee. And on 31 July of 1982, at the wee little age of 21 years of age, I became a second lieutenant in the United States Army. It was one of the greatest days in my life because I looked over on my right shoulder and there was my dad. I can show you the picture. Corporal Herman West Sr. and my mom, Elizabeth Thomas West on my left shoulder, and they pinned those gold second lieutenant bars on my shoulders. And I never seen my dad get teary-eyed, but he got teary-eyed. And, you know, I had to hold back the tears when he was pinning on those bars. But it was such a rewarding experience to finally, in those six years, to look at him and say, Dad, I did what you told me to do. And that's what leadership is all about. You know, a father who was born in 1920 in Ozark, Alabama, got smart, jumped the Chattahoochee River, grew up in South Georgia. But think about what it meant to be a black man born in Alabama in 1920. But yet you answer the call of service to your country in World War II, when your country did not even see you is equal to a lot of others each and every day in your life. And see, that's what leadership is about, that a, a man like that could sit down with his son and say that there's no greater honor than to wear the uniform of the United States of America. And then he challenged me to be what I ended up being. And the great thing is that my nephew, my older brother's son, is uh, he just got promoted to lieutenant colonel in the Army uh, last December. And so he has officially told me that I am Lieutenant Colonel West Ancient. Okay, so, so as with all things, I think that you should go to the Bible. And one of my favorite books in the Bible, my, my, the favorite book in the Bible, New Testament, without a doubt. Joshua is my Old Testament favorite. But the New Testament favorite is Philippians. Because when you want to talk about leadership, read Philippians and understand that Paul is chained in prison awaiting to be beheaded, and he writes this incredible book, these incredible words. And so in my years in the Army, it taught me that there are five letter C's to leadership. And you can find each and every one of those letter C's in the book of Philippians. So let me start out with the first C, and, and you might remember this because this is one of my uh, top ten favorite verses. But the first C is courage. You cannot be a leader unless you have courage. And I think that that is something that really ails us in the United States of America. Because as Thomas Jefferson once said, and I think I shared it with you all previously, in matters of style, swim with the current. But in matters of substance, stand like a rock. And the only way you can stand like a rock is if you have courage. And what does Paul say here? He says that, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so here you are as a young captain, and you're in charge of some troops, and this is your first combat tour of duty, and you just got to believe that you can do this thing. You can't believe it within your own self, but you have to understand that I've been trained. I've been prepared. But you got to look out there and see these other individuals are depending upon me to make the right decisions to keep them safe and secure. And that's why, you know, we have that saying in the military, there ain't no atheists in the foxhole. <laughs> Everybody knows who to pray to when you're in the foxhole. And that's what you see. And so often people are looking to us as the body of Christ. A couple of uh, Sundays ago, the gentleman was here. He talked about being that light. In the United States of America right now, people are looking for that light. People are looking for people with the courage to stand up and say, 
this is right and this is wrong. Because we cannot be in this bizarre world. Remember that Superman comic book where bizarre world, up was down, left was right and everything? I mean, it says that in the Bible, that this time will come, like you said, when people will call bad good and good bad. You've got to have the courage to stand up and say no. That's why we're in this council culture mess. Because some grown-ups stop saying no. You know one of the worst things that happen with our, us and our kids? We told kids that they should get something for doing nothing. It's the culture of the participation trophy. Now, back when I was growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, okay, if, if I was out there on the football field and I missed a tackle, it wasn't my dad, it was my mama. <laughs> okay? My mama would come down there and, and, and tell me what you should be doing. And that's why I said my mom taught me a man must stand for something or else he'll fall for anything. That's all about courage. And that's what we need to have. The second C is competence. And here in Philippians, again, chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if worthy of praise, dwell on these things. It's all about training your mind. When I was a commander of a battalion down here in 4th Infantry Division, 2nd Battalion, 20th Field Artillery Regiment, over 600 soldiers, I deployed them to Iraq in 2003. I had five standing orders. The very first standing order was keep your bayonet sharp. That has two meanings. See, a soldier must always be prepared for the close battle. That's why you got to keep your bayonet sharp, because you never know when you got to go mano a mano with the bad guy. But the other thing is that this is your bayonet. You got to keep your mind sharp. And he says right here, all of these things, this is what you should be thinking about. This is what you should be pondering. This is what you should know because you've got to be ready to answer. If you have the courage and you have the confidence, because guess what, folks? No one follows a dummy into a firefight. I'm here to tell you. And one of the problems we have in the church, too many people are following folks that aren't competent with the word of God. They're preaching, you know, my wife will tell you, that happy to the glad kind of stuff, that prosperity stuff, that make you feel good stuff, instead of just doing what it says here, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right. And there is no such thing as subjective truths. If you have the courage to say that and you have the competence to be able to articulate that, then people are going to follow you. One of the things I challenge each and every one of y'all to do, and my wife will tell you these are always close by to me. The Army taught me you always have your three-by-five cards. You don't leave home without this. Because this is how you're always ready to give a good report. Very first thing here are the eight legislative priorities for the Republican Party of Texas. So that I can always articulate that no matter what happens. That's what it means to be a competent leader. You've got to be able to stand up at any point in time and give a good report. But it always starts with this. Remember what I talked about in Joshua when I first came here and spoke with you all? this book of the law. Do not turn from it from the right or to the left. Meditate upon it day and night. For if you do that, you will have success and prosperity wherever you go. And he also said to be strong and of good courage. Courage and competence. The next one is commitment. Third C, commitment. And when I go over here, I look at Philippians chapter 3, starting verse 13 to 14. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You've got to find your core set of principles and values. You've got to be committed to those things. See, I, I think that right now, we as a nation, we're struggling. Now, America's not lost, but we're in a really deep fog. And the thing is that there's a lighthouse that's out there. And that lighthouse are our principles and values, and you can be committed. If you set your compass to get you going toward that lighthouse, you will come out of the fog. But the problem is that so many people are not committed. So many people don't understand the fundamental principles and values of this great nation. So many people don't understand the interrelationship between the Judeo-Christian faith heritage and the fundamental principles and values of the United States of America. Show me a nation that was founded on the premise 
that your inalienable rights come from a creator God. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's no other nation that's been established on that premise. And let me tell you what is really happening in America with this whole council culture thing. When you have people saying that you can be, you know, whatever you want to be. You don't have to be a little boy or a little girl. You can be whatever you want to be. You know, this whole thing about the weather. I remember when I was down in South Florida and someone asked me at a town hall meeting, you know, he was a lefty guy. He said, Colonel West, uh, Congressman West, uh, I mean, you, you believe in climate change, correct? I said, yeah, winter, spring, summer, and fall. <laughs> okay? Because, see, I remember when I was a little kid, in 1975, they were telling us we were going to freeze to death. Remember that, Pastor? And now all of a sudden, we're going to get too hot to death. So the thing is that what, what, the, what some people are doing is undermining the omnipotence and the, omnipot I mean, the omnipresence of God, the creator God. Because if they say all of a sudden that you can decide whatever gender that you want to be, that you really are in, con you know, we're gonna in control of the weather. It's man-made climate change. It has nothing to do with the Lord and, you know, this perfect order that he has. What they're doing is they're undermining the basic foundation of this country. And if you don't understand that commitment to the founding fathers, when they signed the Declaration of Independence, they didn't ask for man's providence. They asked for divine providence. But see, when we're not teaching the Declaration, we're not teaching the Constitution, we're not teaching civics, we're not teaching that relationship. You know, the three branches of government came from Isaiah. You know, the executive, God the Father, lawgiver, the legislature, the judicial branch, God the judge. All those things are there. Do you know that in the state of Texas, you have how many members of the Texas State House? Uh oh. Do, 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 do. You have 150 members in the Texas State House. Why do you have 150 members in the Texas State House? Can never be changed, no matter what redistricting does, because you have 150 Psalms. How many members do you have in the Texas State Senate? 31, because there are 31 Proverbs. It can never be changed. That's that relationship. And if you're not understanding, if you're not committed to those things, if you don't press toward that inward goal, then someone can get you to believe in anything. Now, even though you may have com commitment, you must also have conviction. Because a lot of people say that I'm committed to this. This is what I believe in. This is what I stand for. And then when things get a little rough, things get a little difficult, they say, yeah, well, maybe I can, you know, lean a little bit this way or lean a little that way. That's not conviction. So conviction, Paul writes, and my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's your conviction. God's got your back. So if you are committed to something, if you are confident and understanding it, if you have the courage to stand up, up, up for it, then you should be convicted in because God's got your back. Remember one of my favorite verses, Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. See, that's why it's so easy for a person like me to be called house inward, sell out, Uncle Tom, Oreo, white man's porch monkey. That's pretty original because I know that I'm rooted in courage. I'm rooted in competence, I'm rooted in commitment, I'm rooted in conviction, because if you're just calling me a name, that means I'm winning the debate. And that's what you gotta understand. Because if you have courage, they call your name, you just step forward. If you have competence, they call your name, you step forward. If you have commitment, they call your name, you step forward. If you have conviction, they call your name, you step forward. You continue to press on. That's what Paul is talking about. You don't surrender. You don't retreat, which is the exact same thing that the 26-year-old wrote in the letter from the Alamo. The last C is character. This is a tough one. I always, we told our daughters, I always taught soldiers, character means doing what is right when no one's watching. 
And that's what Paul says here. Paul says in chapter 1, verse 27 of Philippians, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of gospel. You know, the old folks used to say this. The old folks used to say, people will know you by the company you keep. And that's what we need to think about. You know, I'll never forget, bless you, I'll never forget, you know, this lesson that mom and dad taught me. And I tried, I mean, I'm, Angela's here, she'll tell you, I'm about jacked up as they come. I mean, I ain't, I ain't perfect. I know that. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But my mom and dad say, never go out and do something that you don't want to see on the front page of a newspaper. That's what character's all about. You know, I once had a young soldier, and he said, sir, how do you know that your soldiers respect you? I said, that's easy. I said, see, when you're in uniform, you're wearing that rank, they got to respect you because you, 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 you got that rank. You're a higher rank or whatever. But when you're out downtown in the Walmart, and the soldiers see you in the Walmart, if they see you and they jump over to the other aisle because they're avoiding you, you don't have the respect. You don't have the regard. You're not a leader of character. But if they see you in the Walmart, especially if they're with their family, and they make a beeline to you, and they say, hey, this is my lieutenant. This is my captain. This is my pastor. They respect you because they know that you are are doing like Paul said when he said, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, no matter where you are or where I am. Because the most important thing that we have, ladies and gentlemen, is our reputation. And our reputation should go before us. When a young officer would report in to us, in the military, and you know, you're sitting there at the desk, Pastor, and knock on the door. And you're sitting there, and they've got those steps that they have to take. With each and every step, I'm checking them out, sizing them up. I'm looking at their haircut, looking at their uniform, looking at their boots, everything. Because who you are should speak before you open your mouth. Because when you speak, then you either confirm or deny what I have already made a mental assessment of. If I was standing up here and I had long old dreadlocks and I had a big old belly and everything like that, y'all would say, I don't know what kind of retired colonel he is. <laughs> and that's what you have to continue to do. Be that living example and be a person that lives by character. Five C's. Five C's of leadership. Courage, competence, commitment, conviction, and character. And you will have success wherever you go. And that's what I want to impart to each and every one of you because as I was sharing with Pastor Terry, the problem I see so often, leadership is like a relay race. Back in the day when I could run fast, I was on the 4x100 team. And you know you have that exchange zone. If you hand off the baton too early, you get disqualified. If you hand off the baton too late, you get disqualified. you got to hand it off in the exchange zone. And what we have to start doing is recognizing and training up the next generation of leaders and pass that baton on in the exchange zone so we can continue to run the race to the finish. Let me tell you these last couple little things about leadership, and then we'll answer some of these questions. Issues come with recommendations. Any dummy can tell you that something's wrong. A leader tells you how you can fix it. You know, when you are a leader, nobody wants to see someone lose their cool. Cool heads always prevail. Do you know how Thomas Jackson got the nickname Stonewall? It was at the first battle, depends on which side you're on, Manassas or Bull Run. But it was that first battle, and the Confederacy was running off the battlefield. They were being routed by the Union, Georgians, 
But then there was Thomas Jackson mounted on his horse, directing the action. Even though he got shot in his hand by a sniper, lost a finger. And they said, there, look, man, rally. There stands Jackson like a stone wall. Cool heads always prevail. No one's going to follow a frantic fanny. But if you're always just standing and calm and cool, no matter what is going on in the storm, kind of like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when all the apostles were freaking out because, oh, my God, it's a storm. It's all kind of crazy. And what does he do? He says, peace, be still. That's the type of leader that you want to be. All right, so I got to take some questions here, right? You want me to read them and then answer them? Okay, it says, and you're testing me, right? Obviously, there is a crisis at the border with the immigration of over 6,000 people arriving in the United States per day. How would you handle the crisis differently given the federal directive? First of all, that's why I tell you, you always carry one of these because one of these tells you what the rule of law is. Okay, it's very simple, Spanky. Okay? You had this one and you got this one, and you can never go wrong. So what does it say in the Constitution? It says something very simple. It's called the 10th Amendment. It says all of those powers not designated to the federal government are reserved to the states and to the people. States are sovereign. If you go back and you study, we're called these United States of America, not the. And so states have the right and the responsibility to be able to go and protect their sovereign borders. Texas has a 1,200-mile border. Now, in Article 1, Section 10, Clause Number 3 of the Constitution, it says that a state can take certain actions to defend itself, and the Founding Fathers call it an invasion. So guess what? When people are coming across your border and you didn't invite them to come in, I think that's an invasion. If someone comes into your house and you didn't invite them in, what do you call it? A home Invasion. So the, the, the founding fathers were brilliant, and they wrote it in there, saying now this, the only way that a state can take an action in the absence of the federal government is if they're being invaded, if there is imminent danger. So if you've got 6,000 people coming across your border per day, let me put that in terms of military. That is a brigade size invasion, 600 people, 6,000 people. A brigade. So what are you going to do about it? You must act without admit of delay. That's what the founding fathers put in there. So you got to go down there and you got to secure your border. That's why the state of Texas has a national guard. They should be able to do that. Because what you see happening is a complete abdication of the duties and the responsibilities of the federal government. You cannot institute an ideological agenda by executive order. We are a nation of laws. We are a constitutional republic, not a constitutional monarchy. No one can sit up there on high and sign, you know, pieces of paper and say, like, Pharaoh Ramses and the Ten Commandments, so let it be written, so let it be done. That ain't how it world in the United States of America. And we even fought a revolution because we didn't like that. But remember what I said? With competence and commitment and conviction and courage, you don't have a border crisis. So Texas should be standing up and doing what they're supposed to do, and that's what I would be doing. I would not, I'd turn over to, to Joe Biden and say, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay? If you don't want to do what's right, I will. That's the bottom line. All right, what's the next one up there? Given the concern over the issue above, there is apparent disparity between what are the federal rights versus states' rights. For example, our governor rescinded the mask mandate. You know, that's, oh, however, the national businesses still require Texans to wear masks to enter their business. How would you handle this situation? What are the options for the citizens? You got to understand your rights. Let me tell you, my big concern is that we are just crash test dummies. Okay, there was a huge experiment that happened here in the United States of America, and Benjamin Franklin talked about this. Benjamin Franklin once said, those who would surrender essential liberty for temporary security will, in the end, deserve neither liberty nor security. That's what happened. When you sit back, and remember, competence, courage, commitment, conviction, all those things. If someone, a leader, had to sit back and say, let me tell you something. COVID-19, even with the most dangered demographic, 70 and above, has a 97.5% recovery rate. Overall, COVID-19 has a 99.96% recovery rate. 
We live with viruses every single day. So why would all of a sudden you say that you got to shut down businesses? Because no elected official has the enumerated right or power in this Constitution, in this document, to tell any person that you are or are not essential. Don't. But if you're not studied up on this stuff, then you just sit back and you become the mindless lemming that walks right over the cliff, and they now know that they can control you by fear-mongering you. So you've got to understand your rights. And so if you go in and someone says that uh, you got to put on a mask, can you please show me where that is in law? No, it's our rule. No, ma'am, you don't understand. I am a citizen. In the state of Texas, I'm a citizen of the United States of America. We do not operate by rules, orders, edicts, and mandates. Can you show me where this is in law? Can you show me where this was passed by a legislative body? Because if not, I'm going to sue you. And that's my concern about this whole thing. Civil disobedience is a pretty powerful thing. It's kind of like how we got started. But if you don't understand your rights... And if you don't come together as one, like, like what, did, what did he say here? Striving together for the faith of the gospel. We're not striving together. We're not standing firm in one spirit. If we're just being dispersed, kind of like what happened at the Tower of Babel, then we're just going to be babbling along. And we're always going to be taken advantage of. So you've got to understand. Like I said, these two things, meditate upon it day and night, do not turn from it from the right or to the left. This is powerful stuff. The Word of God and the Constitution. You don't need anything else. All right, next thing. It appears the pandemic has been blown out of proportion, yes, and overstated to ruin the economy and cause widespread dependence upon the federal government. What is your viewpoint and what is the solution? The viewpoint is that we've got to have leaders, not politicians. What, does, what is the difference between a leader and a statesman and a politician? It's very simple. A politician is going to tell you what they think you want to hear. I mean, Bill Clinton instituted this, you know, the, the, the polling thing to get a sense of folks, and then you lead by polling. I never led my battalion by polling. <laughs> if I led my battalion by polling, I, I mean, come on, man. I, I'd have a messed up unit. I took assessments. I'd ask the soldiers, you know, what's going on, you know, how, what, what's, what's happening. But I still had to make the decision. I still had to, you know, issue the orders. And so if we continue to go down the path of being victims, and not victors. <laughs> See, God likes it when you say victors. <laughs> then we're going to we're going to be led like sheep to the slaughter, and that is what I see happening. Let me tell you, where we are in the United States of America is not something that happened overnight. This is 50, 60, 70 years in the making. And the progressive socialist left said, "Okay, let's take over the education system." Then they say, let's take over the media. You go to any major university right now, who controls the schools of journalism? The other side. They're producing the next generation of media folks that talk about one thing. Then the next thing you know, they took over the entertainment industry. Then the next thing you know, they took over the court system. And that's where we find ourselves in this conundrum. And so again, if we don't have people that stand up and have the courage to profess the truth, regardless of what the culture or society said. How many people here remember Andrew Breitbart? Andrew Breitbart said, politics flows downstream of the culture. So they attacked the culture, and now the politics has fall, fl flowed down from that. So we have got to go back out there, and we have got to be the ones that reestablish the culture based upon our fundamental principles and values. Like I said, when this whole council comes, you got to say no. The most important elected position in the United States of America is school board. The election that has the least amount of voter participation in the United States of America, think about it, school board. People don't know. People don't run for it. But you know what happens? People move here from California, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, and they immediately run for city council school board. And then you ask yourselves, why are my kids being taught this foolishness? because they're in control of the curriculum. The Austin Independent School District voted nine to zero to teach basically the sex education curriculum. I don't know if any of y'all saw it, but it's basically pornography to third through eighth graders, pictures and everything. 
Now, the interesting thing was that this exact same curriculum came before the Texas State Board of Education last year. 15 members on the Texas State Board of Education. The vote was nine to six to not accept that curriculum. Nine to six, the Texas State Board of Education would have three votes away from instituting a sex education curriculum that teaches some things I can't say to third through eighth graders. That's in Texas. All right, next one. How do you handle the media who is only reporting what seems right in their eyes and not the truth in virtually every situation? How do you get the truth out and how do you get your message out? How many people here get the chairman's Monday message? Every Monday I put out a message the Republican Party of Texas website. Why? Because whatever's in my, my little beady little brain, I try to get it into your beady little brain. Okay? That's, that's how it has to happen. It's like the Vulcan mind mail. I, you know, I'm dating myself now, but y'all remember Spock, the Vulcan mind mail. I got to transfer knowledge to you guys because that's how we fight as one. That's how we get together as one spirit. That's why we're here tonight. And so each and every one of you is a media source. And so instead of sending that cute little video of the, the cat playing the piano or the baby making cute little faces or whatever, how many of y'all tonight are going to put out on your little Facebook or Twitter or whatever saying that we got 150 state house members in the state of Texas because we have 150 Psalms. We got 31 state senators because we got 31 proverbs. When you put out just those little simple nuggets, you show that relationship between our system of governance and our Judeo-Christian faith heritage. That's all you got to do. Every single day, think about one single little nugget that you can put out there. Now, if there are people that defriend you, they weren't your friend anyhow. In 2008, when my wife and I told a lot of our relatives, we ain't voting for this dude because we read his book. We know what he stands for. I mean, I had some relatives say, you know, we don't want to talk to you. We ain't inviting you to, you know, family reunions or anything like that. I said, I never liked you anyhow. You can't cook, so I didn't want to come. No, but, but that's what you got to do. Remember I said, you got to stand. But you know what? Four years later, they said, you know, you were right. We voted for a historical moment, and we didn't pay attention to our principles and values. You were right. Our mama and daddy, they, they didn't raise us this way. See, that's what happens when you stand. In the near term, it may be a little pain, but folks are always looking for that beacon. So that's how you get the message out. And remember what I said, when people call your name, that's all they got? <laughs> Bring it, okay? Just keep hammering. All right, last one, Is that was that it? The federal government appears to be operating under the modern monetary theory, which is our understanding means they simply create democratic and social programs to cover up the democratic agenda and to pay for them. They print more money regardless of the deficit. Let me tell you something, I'm really worried about the financial situation of the United States of America. You cannot print your your money to the point where you try to cover all of these different programs. I mean, you know, Angela's finance marketing major. She was a business professor when we met. That was one of the greatest sell jobs I ever did. <laughs> was to get a college business professor to marry me, a dumb captain in the United States Army. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But anyhow, but we don't teach these basic financial and fiscal theories. You know, one of the things that I used to do when I was in the grocery store, and this is how you got to break it down, make it simple to folks. So I'm in the grocery store, I'm in the aisle, and they're ringing up the grocery, and I was like, man, man, I wish they, I could just print some money and pay my grocery bill. And folks will look at you and say, well, don't, don't you want to just print your money? So you can't print your own money. I said, yeah, you can print your own money. The federal government's printing their own money, and they're paying their bills, and you got them. Just a simple ability to take something that they do in their everyday lives and correlate it to this big thing called fiscal policy. Too often we don't speak to people in ways that they understand in their own little lives, in their own little world. I was down in South Florida as a member of Congress and I had to speak to some uh, high school students, very rich private school. And so instead of standing up there and tell, talking to them about socialism, Pastor Chris, I just said, okay, it's football season. Who's your biggest rival? And they say, well, you know, these guys, blah, 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 blah. I say, okay, 
So y'all are playing the football game, and so all of a sudden you go out there and it is 21 or 28 to 7 at halftime. How do you feel? What's going on? Well, you know, we feel good. We don't like these guys. We want to crush them. Absolutely. But when you come out after halftime and you look up at the scoreboard and it says 21 to 14, and the coach calls you over to the side. He says, let me tell you what happened over halftime. Some folks got together up there in the press box and they decided that the game wasn't fair. That the self-esteem of the other team was, you know, really down. The cheerleaders were crying. The band was playing off tune. So what they actually did, they took some touchdowns. They took some points from us and they gave it to the other guys. I said, how would they make y'all feel? Every one of those young people, juniors and seniors in high school, that's wrong. You can't take our points that, that we worked hard to do and give it to them. I said, but don't you feel sorry for them? They said, no. They said, we practiced hard. We worked hard. I said, but, you know, so what are you going to do in the second half? You know what one of them stood up and said? Maybe we don't score because we don't know who may make the decision to take the points away and give it to them. See, that's how you take something so complex and you break it down to your kids and you get them to understand because the kids are keeping score even though they say we're not keeping score and we're going to give everybody a participation trophy they're keeping score so when you tell your kids that free does not equal freedom that's how you start to cancel the cancel culture in your own homes so with that being said what are your questions fire away Oh, sorry. <laughs> what are your eight priorities? Well, you need to go to the Republican Party of Texas website. <laughs> no, I just can't. I, I have a card. No. Very close. The, the eight legislative priorities, and these come up from the Republican delegates at the uh, state convention that happened last year. Election integrity is number one. Number two is monument protection. Number three is religious liberty and religious freedom. Number four is constitutional carry. Do you know that yeah. Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire, Utah, they got constitutional carry and Texas doesn't. Bernie Sanders has constitutional carry and we don't. Amazing. Okay. Constitutional carry. Constitutional carry. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Pastor Chris, do you have a permit for your freedom of religion? Do, where's your permit? Where's your permit from the government for freedom of religion? Okay. You don't have one. Okay. Pastor, do you have a permit for freedom of speech? Do you have a permit for the freedom of expression? So if you don't have to have a permit for your First Amendment rights, why do you have to have a permit for your Second Amendment right? You don't. You shouldn't. Because it's a constitutional right. Once you pass your 4473 background check, you should be able to have this thing right here, wherever you go. And so the bottom line is that if you want to have a concealed carry permit, that's so that you can cross the state line and with someone that has reciprocity. But here in the state of Texas, you should not have to have a permit that says that you get to have this right. That's what constitutional carry means. Understand that in the state of Texas, you can carry a long gun without a permit out in the open. But you cannot carry one of these without a permit out in the open. That's absurd. So that's what it is all about, constitutional care. The fifth legislative priority, folks, we got to stop the practice of murdering our unborn babies, okay? In the state of Texas, 53,000 last year murdered in the womb. Now, see, I don't say abortion because abortion is the language of the other side. In the military, you abort a mission. We're talking about murdering an unborn baby. Angela and I are going to be grandparents in May. When we saw that first little picture, little Jackson Bernard, there are people that think that's just a lump of cells. There are people that believe that you should go in and by the most heinous practice, dismemberment. You can't dismember an enemy soldier on the battlefield. But they say you can go inside what is supposed to be the safest place for a baby, in the mother's womb, and cut them up limb by limb by limb. Last thing, you decapitate them. And then you suction out their little parts. You put it in a little bottle and you inventory it to make sure you got all of their parts. That's heinous. So we got to end that. Child gender mutilation uh, modification. That's another thing we want to end that practice. The state of Alabama has passed legislation that's saying that if you try to modify the gender of a, an individual from 19 on down, it's a criminal offense. 
We are giving puberty blocker, blockers and hormonal therapies to kids as young as six years of age. Planned Parenthood now is in the business of doing this child gender modification. This is crazy. When, when I was a kid, I was Alan. If I went up to my dad and said, Dad, you know, I want to be Aline. <laughs> Very bad day for me. Okay? But what's even worse, it's a bad day for the person to put that idea in my head. And so we've got to fix this. The next thing is school choice. School choice is the civil rights issue of this generation because our kids are being forced to be in failed schools where they're being indoctrinated and not educated. We have elevated the teachers' unions over the education of our children. So school choice is so important. Parents got to make decisions. Taxpayer-funded lobbying is the, uh, the next one. Taxpayer-funded lobbying, do you know there are millions upon millions of dollars that are going to lobbyists down in Austin, Texas that are making six and seven figure incomes off of your tax dollars. And what they are doing is they are lobbying against your interests in a lot of these cities and councils and, 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 and counties. That should not happen. And the last one is executive overreach. We're a constitutional republic, not a monarchy. We're not supposed to be ruled by edicts, orders, mandates, and decrees. So those are those legislative priorities. You can find them at the Republican Party of Texas website. And if you were really quick, you could have written them down on three by five card. <laughs> Next question. Colonel West, thank you for being with us, first of all. I'm, I'm, this is my church. This is an honor. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. And uh, I want to honor you for your service. And yeah. uh, I, I saw what you went through in Florida. Uh, during some of your races, followed some of that, and just you know, you just keep, <laughs> you don't stop. You're you're you embody the the five C's that you talk about. The measure about. of a man is not how many times you get knocked down; it's how many times you get back up. Uh, okay. Yeah, my my hat's off. I I think yeah, you're you're amazing. I, I saw your. Uh, you heard that, honey? He said I'm amazing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't I, get that at home. <laughs> no, I just get. I, I absolutely loved your statement whenever um, Texas filed its petition to the Supreme Court and oh. uh, the Supreme Court failed to take up the Texas case. And, and they you abdicated came out. their constitutional duty. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I loved what you, uh, or you, you suggested something about, you know, maybe it's time for secession. No, I didn't say secession. Or I, I forgot how you said it. But I said the something. exact same words from the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. The very first sentence in the preamble of the Constitution of the United States says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. So what I said, that maybe the time is coming for law-abiding states who follow the Constitution to form a more perfect union. And that sent the other side crazy. They were saying that you, you are talking about secession. Now, last week, I wrote a Chairman's Monday message that talked about constitutionalists versus secessionists. Who are the real secessionists in the United mm. States of America? The people that are not following the Constitution, not the people that want to follow the Constitution. Here's the danger of what happened with that Supreme Court decision. In the First Amendment, there is the <laughs> right anyway. to petition government for redress of grievances. That was a very important thing because the, the, the colonists didn't have that, that right. If a state wants to petition the government for a grievance against another state, there's only one court they can go to, the court of original jurisdiction, which is the United States Supreme Court. What happened in last year's election, and really the truth is this, that there are several states, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Arizona, where governors, secretaries of state, and courts changed the election law. Now, if you understand civics, the only people that can change law, the only people that can make law, is the legislative branch. So this was completely unconstitutional, and that's exactly what Ken Paxson and 16 other states said, that, you know, these guys have violated our constitutional right. We no longer have an equal protection under the law. We're following the law. These guys didn't, and this is the result for the rest of us, and that how it affected a national election. And the Supreme Court said, we don't want to hear it. You don't have that right. Either you are on the Supreme Court and you honor by interpreting the law, that's your enumerated responsibility, or you shouldn't be on the Supreme Court. 
So when we have a Supreme Court that is so much worried about society, so much worried about the culture, then what has happened is that the other side has intimidated them. Remember what's that very first C? What's the second C? Competence. What's the third C? Commitment. What's the fourth C? And what's the last C? They completely violated all of those five Cs. And that's what someone should stand up and say, and that's what I said. And Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, she got on Twitter on me, and that was fun. <laughs> to hit her back, it was fun. But that's what you have to do. You got to stand up for what's right. Uh, you gave a great segue into my question. Um, I work in technology, work with a, you know, a lot of the companies, you know, like Google and um, Amazon and those kinds of companies. How do we battle this big tech kind of sure. creating, you know, their own fiefdoms well, that, it's an that, oligarchy. Really can't be, that really can't be battled because yeah, you you know, they control top, top to bottom? Yeah, you can. The state legislature in North Dakota passed a law that will allow their citizens to sue big tech companies. In Florida, Governor DeSantis did the exact same thing. He said that we will find big tech companies if they censor people. That's what that's the power of the Constitution. The power is really down at the state level. And we don't have to allow them to sit back and do these things, intruding into our lives and just thinking that they can manipulate us. So, you know, it's all about the dollar. And if all of a sudden you start to have citizens come together in class action lawsuits and they get them tied up, then you take the power away. Now, let me tell you something else that is happening right here in North Texas when you can talk about technology. Do you know that Chinese companies, communications companies, Huawei and ZTE, got offices right here? One in Richardson, ZTE, and Huawei is right up, you know, Dallas North Tollway in, Pl in Plano. So there's a big problem going on with technology and technology transfers and the theft of intellectual property and all of these things. We have a information oligarchy that is being established in the United States of America that's trying to suppress you, trying to take away your freedom of speech. How many folks here ever read the book or saw the movie 1984 by George Orwell? You need to read it. You need to see that movie. This is exactly what we're living. 1984. Oh, man. <laughs> that is, hey, look, that is, and, and that's, but you know what? You, we laugh, but we are so dumbing ourselves down that, I mean, we may get to that point. I mean, that was pretty funny. Anybody else? Yes, sir. How connected are you guys with the National Republican Party? Well, I will tell you that April, uh, I forget the dates, uh, I think 19th and 20th, the Republican National Committee is having their spring meeting right here in Dallas. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, six and one half dozen, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean that's yeah, that's that's his niece. She, she you know, she's all right, egg. But uh, the bottom line is that we've got to do what is right in our states. We got to do what is right in our local municipalities. You're less than one month away from your municipal level elections. Early voting for municipal level elections starts on April the 19th. The actual election day is May the first. How many of you all here know who is running for city council, school board, county clerk, county commission in your areas? How many of y'all know? See, it's so important. Now I will give a little prop and shout out to my wife. My wife stepped up to the plate to run for city council in the city of Garland. Nice. Because, yeah. So that's what we gotta do. In most of these municipal level elections, if you get an 8% turnout, people are like, that's astronomical. The mayor of Dallas was elected with an 8% turnout. Most of these municipal level elections, maybe 5% turnout. You, I mean, that's where it all starts. All politics are local. So that's why I need you to get engaged. Okay, I have a little bit of a two-part question, but I think they're both brief answers, so I'm going to go for it. The first is, do you have your finger on the pulse of 
the mood in the Republican Party nationally yes, as far I do. as are they motivated to get rid of these weak need Republicans in our federal government that will not stand up. Yeah. And didn't stand up for the stuff with after the election. So that's number one. I yeah, wanna, I mean, and, and I think there? the proof positive is that, Sorry. you know, Spicy. immediately within a week of, you know, with Liz Cheney and the position that she took with the whole uh, impeachment thing, there are two people that were filed to run against her. I mean, her political career is over. And, and you know, remember that your biggest, yeah, it's your vote. People always say, you know, what about term limits? Well, the founding fathers gave you a term limit. It's called your vote. But if you continue to send the same people back up there, how many folks here know who your state house member is? He's a jellyfish. Yep. Everybody should know who your state house member. How many people know who your state senator is? Okay, you got to know that. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. Uh, last night, we were at uh, Studio Movie Grill, and this lady came up. She was just fired up. This is what you got to do. And I said, ma'am, who is your state house member? She said, Ted Cruz. That's your U.S. Senator, ma'am. Who is your state house member? Crickets. See, competence. Next question. Okay, sorry. Um, my next question is: I agree, we've got to organize. I don't know where to start with that. Like, where where does the average person who's raising three kids and working part time and all this stuff? How do we even do that? Because I feel pretty confident in Texas in our election integrity, although I'm a little. I feel like the no, bad Texas guys have still learned have how to cheat some, and I'm yeah. trying. They'll try here too next, and so I'm kind of like, we can't affect these other states. Like we tried, they already stole a bunch of stuff in this last election, like without a doubt in my mind. So we can follow the law, but they're going to keep doing their thing. How do we organize on a scale that does not allow our federal government to continue down this path? Like I don't understand the practical steps of how we. Go Once again, it, it comes back to understanding that the states have the power. And what happened in last year's election was that Republican state legislatures got steamrolled. They sat around and they saw governors, secretaries of state, and, and courts change election law. And they did not do anything about it. So, again, it just comes up. If we understand this thing right here, then they really sat down and said, how can we come up with a scheme, a plan, that no matter what happens, they can't screw it up? But yet we've found a way to screw it up, and it comes back to that very first C, the courage to stand up and do what is right. Now, let me tell you about Texas. Uh, Dallas County and Harris County, two big issues for us, because if you want to see election irregularities, Dallas County and Harris County. The county clerk down in uh, Harris County, Chris Hollins, who is the treasurer for the Texas Democrat Party, tried to mail out 2.7 million unsolicited ballots in Harris County. Now, you may say, no, oh, 2.7 million, that's no big deal. President Trump only won Texas by between 600,000, 630,000 votes. Can you imagine if 2.7 million ballots had gotten out there? What could have happened in Texas? And he also did this thing called curbside voting which means that he just went out there and said that, hey, we're going to put a polling location on the curbside, and we're going to take votes from people, but they were only in nine Democrat precincts in Harris County. So we do have some issues and problems. That's why election integrity is our number one legislative priority here. But again, it comes down to people that understand the rule of law, that you do not suspend the rule of law because there's a quote-unquote pandemic with a 99.96% recovery rate. But yet we fell for that. Go back to April the 14th of 2020, Time Magazine. Eric Holder, who is in charge of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, wrote an op-ed piece, Time Magazine. You know what the title of that op-ed piece was? How Coronavirus Should Permanently Change Elections in America. April the 14th of last year, they laid out their plan. You know what their plan was? Institute universal mail-in ballots and ballot harvesting all across the country. How many folks here have read H.R. 1? How many people know what H.R. 1 is? H.R. 1 says that all across the country there will be universal mail-in ballots and ballot harvesting. There will be no voter registration reviews. There will be same-day voter registration, same-day voting, online voter registration. There will be no voter ID anywhere in the United States of America. That's what H.R. 1 says. That's a nationalizing of elections by the progressive socialist left. If that were to ever get signed into law, we have got to protect ourselves and have strong election 
laws here in the state. It does matter. It does matter because you have to be, no, the ship has not sailed. And that's what they want you to believe. They want you to believe that you're defeated. <laughs> no. I mean, we we just watched them pull it off in front of our face. Okay, but the point is this. Fool me once. What is shame on who? Shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. So if we allow them to go back to they the They didn't fool us, Alan. They stole they, it, No, Alan. no, no. They did, they did fool us. They did fool us. And this is the bottom line. What happened is that, again, you all you had to do was have state legislatures that said no. I'll give you a case in point. My home state of Georgia, which had a Republican governor, a Republican secretary of state. How does a Republican secretary of state go into a consent decree, a consent agreement with Stacey Abrams to say that you don't have to have signature verification on mail-in ballots when just two months ahead of that, the Supreme Court ruled against the South Carolina Democrat Party saying that you must have signature verification on mail-in ballots. Where was the state legislature? That's all I'm saying. It comes right back to what I started out with. The very first C is courage. They depend on us to be weak. They depend on us to not fight back. That's what they're banking on. And they're depending on you to say, I'm dejected, I'm depressed, they took it away from me, I don't want... What happened? But what happened What happened in Georgia? What happened in Georgia? People got up and said, why go out and vote? Right. Right. Of course, and we've already lost there, too. I'm not saying we don't fight. I'm just saying we don't step back into the room where everything's really slim. It's maybe where we actually have to fight. That's where you fight in your state. You fight in your state because that's why the Founding Fathers, your very last amendment in your Bill of Rights is the Tenth Amendment. It says all of those powers are reserved to the states and to the people. And all we have to do is understand the power that we have in ourselves and here in our sovereign states. But you just got to have the courage to stand up and do it. If you don't, they're going to continue to No one can rule over us by executive order. They can't. And you know who said that they can't do it? The North Dakota State Legislature. You ever heard of constitutional nullification? They passed constitutional nullification, which says that we ain't following your executive orders. We're not following any law that you pass is not pursuant thereof to the Constitution. Those are the words that the Founding Fathers used in the Supremacy Clause. The federal government is supreme over states as long as they are passing laws that are pursuant thereof to the Constitution. If you don't, you say, sorry, man, ain't doing it. But they depend upon you saying, oh, you know, they can't do it. They got the courts. I'm sorry. No judicial activist is going to take away my rights. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know you've already addressed border protection and everything. Last week when the three or four buses loads of children come into Dallas. Oh, it was much more than that. It's oh, 3, like a thousand kids yeah, 3, on the buses. They're and not they're not kids. kids. They're 15 to 17 year old boys. We think. Well, that's, yeah. yeah, they're probably older than that even. How as a state, as a church and as an individual, do you deal with that? It's very simple. You know, render unto God what is God's, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. You know, Christians are supposed to be subject to government. It talks about that in Romans. I think it's chapter 13. But you're supposed to be subject to righteous government. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not say, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to, you know, pray to you. They said no. Daniel didn't say, oh, we're going to pray to you. No. Nope. So we have a rule of law, and we're supposed to follow that rule of law. And I know that a lot of times people tug on your Christian heartstring and say, oh, you mean nasty Christian. You're not really compassionate or whatever. Let me tell you a, a, a little metaphor. When you're a commander, I want you to think about this, and you're in a combat zone, and it's pouring down rain, sandstorm. I mean, it just really sucks. But you're supposed to have guards, sentinels out, right? Well, what if you say, you know what? It's just too bad conditions out there. We're not going to have any guards tonight because I want to be a compassionate commander. That's not compassion because what you're doing is you're putting your entire unit at risk. 
See, what a compassionate commander does, he goes out there and stands watch with those soldiers and tells them how important it is to be out there. You go out there and you suffer through those conditions with those soldiers. A compassionate Christian says that, you know, I care about these folks, and so we'll send a mission trip. We'll reach out to them in their country. We'll, we'll, we'll create an orphanage for the kids. Whether, but you don't have to sit up and say, yeah, just let them on in. Because if you continue to believe that, then you believe that America is just a piece of land in between Mexico and Canada. And you surrender your sovereignty. <laughs> well, it again, does. no, that's no, it, it's that's that's the truth. Mm-hmm. I mean, you cannot be here illegally. Right. It's just the bottom line. I mean, I mean, you know, and you just remember what I said. The very first C is the courage to stand up there and say that, regardless of people, what they're going to, you know, demonize you or whatever. Say, look, either we. Stand upon the book of the law, this one and that one. We do not turn from it from the right or to the left. We meditate upon it day and night. Then we will have success and prosperity wherever we go. Or we just give up and say, hey, open door, open, open borders. There's no other country that does what we do. So why, why do we think that we need to do this? And it just takes principal individuals to stand up in the storm and says to all those crazy voices out there, peace be still. Hey there, uh, first question, is that a 22 kill ring? Yes, it is a 22 kill ring. Uh, 22 kill ring is significant in the fact that on average per day in the United States of America, 20 to 22 veterans are taking their lives. That's, you want to talk about compassion? We got homeless veterans right here. Mm-hmm. Now, we just brought 3,000, you know, I don't know who they are. But the men and women who are willing to lay down their lives for this country to make the last full measure of devotion, we got them living on the streets. See, that's how you come back to people and say, let's take care of our own first. Because we should not have a homeless veteran. We should not have a jobless veteran. Okay? Not one. Yes, sir. Well, uh, Jacob Schick gave me his off his off his finger, so just don't tell him I'm not wearing it because I'm a bunch of push-ups. <laughs> oh, you're on camera. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shoot. I'm on camera. No, secondarily, yeah. are you uh, or have you considered running for governor? Oh, man. <laughs> you know, trust in the Lord with all that heart, lean not upon your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge him and he'll guide your paths. You know, right now, the biggest priority for me is the, the legislative session. And after the legislative session, I'll be in prayer. And I'll make the We'll make the right decision for God, for country, for Texas, and for us. We we will. I mean, because I I can't do it unless I I have her support. But there ain't a day that goes by that I don't get my arm broke about that and twisted. So, But we have to make sure we're doing what God says. And so you all pray that I will be an obedient servant to his will, not my own will, but an obedient servant to his will. So don't go out there with any selfish prayers and say, God, please make him run for governor. Please. That's a selfish prayer. You just say that God make him an obedient servant. Last one? Well, yeah, last one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do we do as individual? Because we're we're exactly what you're saying. We Three things. Agree. Three things. But I know both. Okay. Step one, be informed and informed. Step two, be educated and educate. Step step three, be activated and activate. Too often what we do is we go out on this battlefield and we, you talked about the full armor of God, we ain't got on no armor. Mm -hmm. And the other side just rips us apart. So what I will say is that, you know, even in this church, you can have a little subcommittee that talks about legislative issues and sends out a legislative alert to all the people here in this church and get them on one accord, like I said, get that that one spirit all together on one mind. And that's what we have to do because, you know, h- how many people here have read Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto? <clears throat> how many people here have read Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals? See, you can't go up against these guys if you don't understand their mindset. Where do you find the first mention of state control of education. First time it was ever written about in the world. The Communist Manifesto of Karl Marx. Where do you find the eradication of private property? 
First time is ever Karl Marx. Where do you find the concept of a central financial institution? Communist Manifesto. Federal Reserve Bank was committed, was created during Woodrow Wilson's administration. Where do you find the first mention of a progressive tax system, which means the more you make, the more the government can take from you? Communist Manifesto. So here we are. We've got so many of our operating systems in our country that come from the Communist Manifesto written by Karl Marx. Then you travel right not too far away from here to Grapevine, Texas. Grapevine High School has the Marxist Club. Now, where are the mommies and daddies? Where are the people that said, you're not having that? So that's what I want you to do. Be informed and inform. Be educated and educate. Be activated and activate. Be that church to the unchurched. Be that light to the people that are in a fog looking for a lighthouse. But what you got to do is when you go out there, you got to be encouraged. You got to be the happy warrior. Let me close on telling this story. How many people have ever heard of the Battle of Gettysburg? Anybody ever been to Gettysburg? Okay, I've been there. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was a professor of rhetoric at Bowdoin College, Maine. But Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain made the decision that, you know, I can't just sit here while other people are out there fighting to preserve the Union, fighting to preserve the United States. So he volunteered to go and be a soldier. But because he was an educated man, they made a lieutenant colonel. It took me like 20-something years to make a lieutenant colonel. They just automatically made him one. But all of a sudden, he's put in charge of an infantry regiment. Never been to West Point. No military training whatsoever. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, on the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, July the 2nd of 1863, found himself at the end of the line of the Army of the Potomac. 90,000 Union soldiers, the only thing that stood between Robert E. Lee, the Army of Northern Virginia, and Washington, D.C. The Union soldiers were on Cemetery Ridge in a, what is called a fish hook. He's the last person. His orders, you cannot surrender. You cannot retreat from this spot. You must stay here and hold this little round top, or else the entire Army of the Potomac would be captured. Hot July day. John Bell Hood. The Texan is on the other side, commanding the Confederates. First attack comes. They repel it. Another attack comes. Seven attacks against Chamberlain. Casualties mount. Chamberlain's even shot in the leg. They run out of ammunition. Now, here is a professor of rhetoric, not a trained military man, faced with an incredible situation. No ammo. Casualties mounted. And they're coming again. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain drew his sword and gave an order that had never been given in the Union Army to that day. He said, charge. They fixed bayonets. They charged down the hill. It so shocked the Confederates, and they saved the day for Gettysburg. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, an ordinary professor of rhetoric, because of his courage and his bravery, he was given the honor of being the one who accepted General Lee's surrender. His troops lined up the road leading to the Appomattox Courthouse. And he was the guy that saluted Lee as he came in to surrender to the Union. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain became a recipient of the Medal of Honor, the highest award the United States military can give to someone, a professor of rhetoric, an ordinary person. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain became the two-term governor of the state of Maine. A man that sat there and said, what can I do? He did something. And he was the reason why we preserved this union on July the 2nd of 1863 at a place called Little Round Top at Gettysburg. That's the story of America. That's the story of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who was born in a manger, not in a palace or anything special. He came from humble, ordinary beginnings. And still to this day, 
He is changing lives all over the world.